Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Lindstrom, and I serve as the Edward Henry Professor of Political Science and Director of the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. And welcome to this year's Frontiers and Freedom Lecture Series. I first want to extend a real big thanks to Mark Kennedy, current president of the University of Colorado. Mark has supported the McCarthy Center since our beginning nearly 15 years ago, and his leadership is, brings us together tonight for this Frontiers and Freedom program. Last year, this lecture series featured Lauren Simmons, who was a 20-something, was the youngest black female trader on Wall Street. Previous speakers included corporate CEOs, presidential campaign managers, leaders of the UK parliament, and top trade officials. We are very honored tonight to have Bob Zolik and Mark Kennedy with us. While both of our guests have held presidential titles, one currently does as well, I also want to especially thank all of our guests out there listening tonight, because I also know that President Biden is speaking this evening. So uh, a bit of competition, but we thank you all. And in conclusion, I'm very pleased to introduce Skylar Gast, who will introduce Bob Zolik and Mark Kennedy. Skylar is one of our all-star student coordinators with the McCarthy Center. She's a three-year veteran with the center and comes to St. Ben's and St. John's from Northern Wisconsin. Like President Kennedy, she's a, an accounting and finance major and looks forward to her new career in New York City beginning this summer. Skylar, thank you for joining us tonight. The stage is yours. Thank you, Matt. That was very, very sweet. Um, but thank you all for being here tonight. It is my honor to present this year's Mark Kennedy Frontiers of Freedom lecturer, Bob Zellick. Bob Zellick served as the 11th president of the World Bank, Deputy U.S. Secretary of State, U.S. Trade Representative, and served in the Department of Treasury and the White House. So currently he works for the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard, at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and is a non-executive chairman of Alliance Bernstein's, a leading global Im investment management firm. Our interviewer today is Mark Kennedy. Mark Kennedy is an SJU alum who previously served as president, president of the University of North Dakota and as director of the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University following his eight years as member of Congress. And currently he serves as the president of the University of Colorado. So today, Mark Kennedy will interview Bob Zellick on current global affairs and on his new book, America and the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. Zellick, Zellick's book reflects his time as a leader in public policy and demonstrates the belief that the United States is an exceptional ongoing experiment, both at home and in international relations that should serve a larger purpose. So yes, as a student who loves accounting and loves public policy and civic engagement, I'm very honored and excited to welcome you both with us today. So the floor is yours, please take it away. Well, thank you much, uh, Skylar. And I wanna first turn it over to Mr. Zellick who has some comments about uh, the university that we're talking to right now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. And, and thank you, uh, Matt and Skylar for the invitation. Um, I just wanted to open by saying, uh, it's a very, it's a real privilege to be here uh, with all of you. Um, I'm also a Midwesterner, uh, the lower Midwest, uh, Illinois, and I was always drawn uh, to international interests. And um, as I studied a little bit about uh, St. Benedict and St. John's, I, I see a very similar tradition um, founded from monks from Bavaria. So I wore blue and white today, the Bavarian colors uh, in memory of that. Uh, but I was also impressed to see you have students from about over 50 countries, uh, 200 courses with global focus, uh, top ranked study abroad program. And I'm delighted it was, has been recognized, for example, with the Senator Paul Simon Award for Comprehensive Internationalization. What I also was struck by was that all this effort at the university level has paid off for your graduates. I saw you have a very large number of international scholarships, particularly Fulbright uh, fellowships, uh, top producer of Peace Corps volunteers, and some graduates that are on the international scene today, such as Dennis McDonough, the now Secretary of Veteran Affairs, and General Nakasone of, of Cyber, uh, uh, CyberCon. And of course, I want to thank my friend uh, Mark Kennedy, uh, who's the person who brought me to be here with you today. Uh, I first got to know Mark as a member of Congress, but our careers have intersected in both his academic and, and his business life. 
And I'm always proud to recognize being president of one major state university is impressive enough, but having two on your record is really quite striking. And, but also as, as for the topic today, I think uh, I was always pleased when Mark was in Congress that while well, he took care of his uh, constituents, he always had a very strong interest in America and the world as does St. Benedict and St. John's. Well, thank you, uh, Bob. That's uh, nice of you to say, and you're right. They do have a very international flavor on campus and a lot of study abroad, good international students. So we hope that both now and when people might watch this uh, as it's taped, that uh, we can inspire a few of them to continue in a career very similar to yours. To kick off, uh, tell us, why did you write the book? So when I was in government in those various positions that Skyler mentioned over a number of administrations, I, I drew upon history um, when I was trying to think through problems. And so I wanted to encourage others, uh, particularly those of next generation, to think in those terms. Uh, many foreign policy courses these days, as the students and perhaps some of the professors know well, often focus on international relations theories. And while those are interesting to debate and, and to understand, I, I found that they often weren't of such use when I was dealing with issues such as German unification or trade strategy or China policy or genocide in Darfur, or World Bank and development. And what I wanted to do through this book was to tell stories about individuals over some 200 years with practical problem solving. Now, some people who've read a lot in this field may know that Henry Kissinger wrote a book titled Diplomacy in the 1990s, where he talked about history and foreign policy. But Dr. Kissinger tends to respect, reflect the, the real politic European tradition. So my idea in this book was to use the stories and the individuals to also talk about some of the ideas across the, the range of American experience. And particularly for a university audience, um, when I held those various posts, I often had assistants or colleagues who were younger and I suppose I used to torture them a little bit by asking historical questions because I had no knowledge of what they'd studied in history. And insofar as they had studied history, I learned they tended to focus on uh, World War II and beyond. And the first 150 years of, of American history are rich with experience and, and ideas. So I probably wanted to recall them a little bit from the mists of time. And the last point I guess is that uh, when I've spoken to some other students, I've been a little bit encouraged that they've enjoyed the practical problem solving nature of, of the book so that um, there's a certain optimism about history offering insights on how to do better as opposed to timeless obstacles. Those are, those are great reasons. And you, you mentioned uh, Kissinger's diplomacy uh, having a very different view than yours. You, he took the European experience you're taking the American experience. As a person who's read a lot of books in foreign policy, if you're a young student saying, hey, this is very interesting to me, I'd like to explore this, I would encourage them to read both books, your books and Kissinger's books. But when you talk about how do you sum up American foreign policy, our approach to the world, you say that if you did it in one word, it would be pragmatic. Can you elaborate on what is the degree, what is the degree to which pragmatism is at the heart of American foreign policy. So what I was trying to get at with the pragmatism was first, uh, as some people who study a little bit of philosophy may recall, for William James and, and John Dewey, uh, who were the uh, starters of the pragmatic philosophy tradition, it's probably the major American contribution to philosophy. And there's a certain connection I saw with, with uh, the world of foreign policy. And the, the pragmatists in foreign policy or philosophy are somewhat wary of abstractions or dogmas. And they're trying to focus on the world of messy facts and empirical experience as opposed to theoretical boxes. Um, and so there's a real uh, interest in the results, uh, what works, um, means and ends. And so applying that to diplomacy, you have to begin with close attention to the realities on the ground. And that often starts with power relations. They can be military, it can be economic, technology. Sometimes it's, it's gathering votes, including in international organizations. You have to be alert to processes and institutions. How do things actually get done? Not just discussing 
the theories of what you might wish, the ideals, um, you need to know the positions of others and, and their interests if you're gonna be able to either negotiate or put together coalitions. There's always the role of chance and contingency, uh, which is part of the pragmatic philosophy as well as diplomacy and recognizing the world's a deeply uncertain place. Timing is very important, when to act, when not to act. Um, and I suppose going back on the theme about learning from history that imperfect results in a far from perfect world could still be a pretty good, yet, pretty good day. It can be, and it uh, seems to work out so far. Now you did mention that St. John, St. Ben's have a lot of Peace Corps volunteers. And diplomacy and aid play uh, plays a big role in diplomacy. Aid reflects our our nation's generosity, but it also can be a mechanism to shape behavior on the global stage. You talk a lot about the Marshall Plan and how there was a lot of self-interest in that, in that we needed a strong Europe, but also it was a prod to get them to move in a direction where they were working more together and, and moving uh, the, the countries of Europe in a unified way. How has US aid, you know, you're the head of the World Bank and very involved in this, how has it shaped global conduct and it, what's it, how is it can be used to lead the world to a place that's more likely to lead to peace and collaboration and less need to have military conflict? Well, you've touched on a number of the key themes. You know, the, the role of, of aid in development or diplomacy is very multifaceted. To start with the example you did, of the Marshall Plan, uh, to put this in some context, um, the Marshall Plan invested about $14.2 billion. Uh, so this was in 1948 to the early 50s. That would be about $140 billion today. It was about 1.2% of GDP in 1950. So that would be over a trillion dollars today. So you can see the scope of what was done uh, with that plan. But as you mentioned, the context is very important to understand. So the Marshall Plan came out of George Marshall, who was at that time Secretary of State. He'd been Chief of Staff of the Army in World War II. Came back from a meeting with Stalin and the other uh, four powers in Moscow in 1947. And he recognized that the, the problems of, of recovery and even survival for many people in Western Europe didn't really trouble Stalin because he thought that Soviet Union might be able to take advantage of the upheaval and have communist, communism spread. So the interesting idea was that the Marshall Plan really began to avoid a US military commitment. The idea was to help um, Europe stand on its own without military forces. But before long, they realized it wouldn't work without the recovery of West Germany. So they had to create West Germany because at the time you had the three zones for the French, the British, and the Americans. You had a separate set of Soviet zones. That triggered the Berlin crisis. People may remember where the Soviets tried to put a blockade around Berlin, and the United States led an extraordinary airlift to supply uh, Berlin for almost a year. And that also then recognized you did need to have a security dimension to deal with the Soviets, but also with some of the anxieties in Western Europe, because if you're going to help uh, Germany recover, the Federal Republic of Germany, then France and the other countries that Germany had recently marched over were anxious about making sure there was U.S. security. So the story is an interesting one that gives you a sense of how you could combine aid, development, security, uh, and also democracy. But another example would be South Korea. So South Korea, after the 1950 to 1953 war, and it led to the stalemate you still have today, has had an incredible recovery and is leading to one of the world's sort of leading industrial economies. As you know from your work in Congress, uh, aid to Israel and Egypt has been uh, important for the foreign assistance aspect. Um, you mentioned the World Bank and the IMF, both created in 1944 as a way to, at, at the end of World War II, to try to avoid the problems of the 1920s and 30s. Um, those institutions uh, have members of 160, 170 other countries, but if used properly can also, can often sort of help uh, with sort of US interests, whether it's fragile and post-conflict states, whether it's developing countries, whether it's uh, uh, Eastern Europe or the Soviet, the broken up of the Soviet Union. And uh, in particular, 
one other aspect that I've often been involved with, and I know you've had an interest in, is the connection of aid and trade. So how you can help countries be able to, whether humanitarian or build their private sector, or develop institutions, fight corruption, but also connect them to the international trading system because you saw first in East Asia and then around the world how trade was important in development. I mentioned fragile and post-conflict states. That may be also an interest to many people in the St. John's community because one of the areas that I tried to focus on at the World Bank was the unique problems of countries that were either coming out of conflict or a very fragile governance because the issues weren't simply those of development. They weren't simply the issues of security. They weren't simply issues of governance. You had to combine them. And to give you a wonderful example, that's the challenge of Central America today. So you can see the Biden administration trying to figure out with the problem of, of migrants or asylum seekers, if you don't have conditions of security and opportunity at home, people are gonna come north. Then there's the humanitarian side that you mentioned, which has often uh, been related to US agriculture programs. It's had a self-interest sometimes because it's also been used to buy some US farm supplies. Another one that you were a part of that had a historic effect in Sub-Saharan Africa and has some echoes today was President Bush 43's PEPFAR program. This is the HIV AIDS program, which probably did more for Americans uh, humanitarian efforts and development efforts in Sub-Saharan Africa than any other project because it saved so many different lives and people in the region recall today. And you'll see, I imagine, as people try to think about how to deal with COVID and vaccines, some, some parallels to this. So when one thinks about the broader issues of climate or pandemics or development, you will inevitably find an aid component. And then the challenge over the years is how do you combine this with local ownership for development because development doesn't work unless the local people feel that uh, it's their projects. How do you deal with the corruption issues? How do you try to have higher standards? And how do you make sure that uh, you're bringing together other resources, including from the private sector? It is complicated and you do weave a lot of different assets or tools within the foreign policy realm in order to accomplish the many goals that, that we have as a nation and, and what we want to do for the world. You know, I'd, I'd like to talk about the five traditions you identify that have emerged from America's encounters with the world. These are the importance of North America, the special role trading, transnational, and technology relations play in defining our ties to others, changing attitudes towards alliances and ways of ordering connections among states, the needs for public support, especially through Congress, and the belief that American policy should serve a larger purpose. In discussing North America, I don't believe it's fully understood how having friendly neighbors like Canada and Mexico is such a huge advantage to US's ability to act in the world. Help us understand why the North American continent as a whole is so important and how we're stronger together. Well, people from Minnesota or uh, North Dakota before that, Mark, might have a better sense of the importance of our Northern neighbor with Canada. But th this is a wonderful sort of oversight in much of, of US foreign policy discussions today. <clears throat> if you go to the website of most foreign policy institutions, you'll see uh, projects related to Europe and Asia, and often the Middle East and sometimes Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, almost never <laughs> focus on North America. But of course, it was obviously critical for the United States in the 19th century. And as I try to set out in the book, it was awful important in the 20th century too. We almost went to war again with Mexico in 1916 and 1917. The Cuban Missile Crisis, the great nuclear showdown was in the Caribbean right off our shores. Um, and then NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, needs to be understood as much more than a trade agreement. It was trying to recognize the transformation of Mexico that's, that's going on today. But another way to think about this is if you ask, as some surveys do, about interests of the American public and foreign policy, they'll often come across topics such as um, environment, immigration, uh, economic uh, development and integration issues, narcotics and organized crime. Well, those are all issues that are at the heart of the North American agenda. 
Um, I came across a speech that Ronald Reagan gave in 1979 as he was just launching his presidential campaign. And he said that the United States would be better off if our neighbors, Mexico and Canada were stronger. And he said, it's time we stop thinking about our nearest neighbors as foreigners, which is pretty, pretty different from what we've heard over the past few years. But if you would try to think about it today, to me, it's not only an issue about North America alone, it's seeing North America as the continental base for the United States, as well as Mexico and Canada in a global environment. So if you think about 500 million people, three democracies, energy, uh, self-sufficiency, ability uh, to export, um, greater, better demographics than you have in China or Japan or Europe or any other parts of the world, if we see our people as a, as a resource as opposed to a problem. Um, infrastructure issues, I mean, just in, to, in the business pages over the past couple uh, weeks, you've seen two Canadian railways wanting to buy Kansas City Southern, which is a US railroad that also connects to Mexico, trying to build the infrastructure. So as President Biden talks about infrastructure, you might wanna think about the North American dimensions of that, including that uh, with the private sector. And so one can see how it really runs through the role of the United States having more influence and leverage around the world if we've got a strong base uh, at, at home. And as you think about the broader issues today, you know, one that the administration will need to deal with is that there was a renegotiation of NAFTA creating what's called the USMCA, US-Mexican-Canadian Agreement. There are labor provisions in that agreement which allow the United States to bring actions against individual plants in Mexico for labor violations. It's quite an extraterritorial reach. That could be used in one of two ways. It could be used to help strengthen labor unions in Mexico, which would be important as an institutional development, but it could also be used to frankly block Mexican exports. If some of the participants in the US want to use this as an excuse to block Mexican trade, so that'll be something very important to watch. As you look forward, uh, we talk about infrastructure. What will be with the infrastructure relations with both Canada and Mexico, border security issues. And of course, uh, with climate change, now with Canada, there's a whole new set of issues in the Arctic. So there's a full plate of North American issues. And one of the things I wanted to draw attention to in the book is that these are not only important historically, and important to the people of the United States, but they'll be important to our global power too. It will indeed. And I would just say to the participants, we want to make sure we get your questions. So there is a Q&A function there. Feel free to throw a question in and we'll, we'll get to them, but I can go on uh, all night uh, with uh, gaining the insights of uh, Mr. Zellick. Uh, you know, in your chapter on Veneva, I, may, I maybe got the pronunciation wrong. Veneva. Veneva. And Eva Bush, you quote the, his paper, Science, the Endless Frontier, in which he wrote, scientific progress is one essential key to our security as a nation, to our health, to more jobs, to higher standard of living, and to our culture, cultural progress. We don't often think of technology as a central element of US foreign policy, but it has been since Vannevar Bush's time. Help us understand how technology, what role that plays in foreign policy and our strength in the world. So given Colorado University's strong engineering department, I thought this would be one that might catch your eye. Uh, and so to, for, for people who haven't had a chance to look at the book, this is another chapter that you won't find in most foreign policy books <laughs> because Van Eber Bush, uh, as Mark mentioned, is really the godfather of an American diplomacy that leverages perpetual and scientific and technological change. So I'll have chapters on geopolitics. Given my background, I work a lot about the economic issues, but I wanted to use this chapter to focus on the importance of science and technology with America's role in the globe. So Van Eber Bush, the, the unusual first name was, uh, it, it was a friend of his father's who was from, uh, who was from the Netherlands. So that's a Dutch name. And um, Bush was really a polymath engineer. Um, he was a vice president and dean at MIT. Um, he became head of the Carnegie Science Institution in Washington. And he, he actually positions himself as World War II starts to create a new small organization 
working directly for President Franklin Roosevelt to try to connect America's science and technology to the war effort. And he doesn't do it with a big bureaucracy. He, in a sense, he creates a contract system and draws together some of the experts from around the United States. And they come up with things like proximity fuse. They came up with operations research to deal with the U-boats. He's the principal liaison with uh, Roosevelt for, for the atomic bomb project, uh, radar, a um, whole series of interesting developments. But then in 1944, he's concerned about what's gonna to happen to science policy after World War II. So he works with Roosevelt's White House team to have Roosevelt send him a two page letter that basically asks him about the future of science policy. And uh, this leads to a report called Science, the Endless Frontier that, that is issued in 1945. And it's really the foundation for what at Stanford was called the triple helix system. Basic research supported by the government, role of universities, but also the private sector. And at heart, what, what Bush is trying to do is to recognize that science is critical to broader national security, but he wants a place for mavericks and independent thinkers. He doesn't want just sort of a, a, a bureaucratic control. He's trying to sort of meld those two in an effective system. And in my view, this is, ends up being quite important with our competition with the Soviet Union in the Cold War, where by the 1980s, the Soviet Union, even though it invested a lot in space and various technologies, just can't keep up with the information technology revolution. It'll be important with our competition with China. But there's another dimension that might also be important for a student audience, which is for issues like climate change or biological security and pandemics, I wanted to use this chapter to draw attention to the special challenges of combining diplomacy with science and technology. So when I worked in the first Bush administration, 89 and 92, I was the head of the US delegation for the only climate change conference, the 92 framework agreement that actually was ratified by the Senate. And that's the framework that actually leads to the national action plans that you read about in Paris and even that uh, President Biden was just talking about sort of last week going to the Glasgow conference. So there are different issues about diplomacy and science and technology. So I use this chapter to kind of draw attention to those. But one other aspect that just shows what an extraordinary man that Bush was, was in the same month of July 45 that he witnesses the atomic bomb test, that he tests, that he has this, this, uh, this uh, report come out. He writes an article for the Atlantic where he imagines what he calls a Memex machine. And remember, this is 1945. People were just starting to have big computers, much less the conception of a small one. And he's basically conceiving what becomes the desktop PC. He's some that a device that will access information, link around the world. And a reprint of this article is discovered by a radar technician in Leyte in the Philippines in a, in a Red Cross library on stilts. And it leads the fellow to go back and become one of the pioneers for American computer science and engineering. Um, and, and, uh, and indeed also one of Bush's graduate students becomes provost at Stanford and found something that is now known as Silicon Valley. So it's a wonderful sense of the interconnections of, of human beings on these events. It is, and I think technology continues to be a very big role, plays a very big role in our foreign policy. Uh, and you know, we could go on that uh, for a long time, but we, we talked about how aid is one component and it's used with many other streams of uh, activity within foreign policy to achieve the goals we're, we're seeking in the world. But besides your, your five traditions, there's this uh, chapter on Lyndon Johnson. And, and for those that are thinking about reading the book, it's, it's really great in that you pick a person within a, within a period of time and drill down and it, it makes it a wonderful narrative. But you talk about, there were six factors that you outlined as leading to what went wrong in Vietnam. You suggest, I think appropriately, that these factors serve as cautions for future US diplomacy. I like to drill down on one of them, combining military power and diplomacy. Too often in foreign policy, we view these as mutually exclusive, often to our detriment as a nation, in that we should use either or, but in reality, we should use them together. How do they reinforce each other? And why is, this, why is there a tradition in America of separating them? <laughs> 
So just to come back with you where you started, Mark, you know, I, many of the stories uh, talk about dealing with problems pragmatically, but I, I had a faculty in graduate school seminar at, at Harvard and they said, you, you, you can't ignore Vietnam. <laughs> and so, um, and there's a couple others where uh, things don't work out in the way we might have wanted. But as you mentioned, what I focused in Vietnam was the critical decisions in late 1964, early 65, to really Americanize um, the ground war. And the history of this period has been very well researched and written. So what I was trying to do in this chapter, even more than others, was to bring to bear my experience as a practitioner to kind of say what went wrong, and that's those factors. <clears throat> and you, you focused on the critical one that, that Kissinger draws attention to, which is that how Americans tend to see military action and diplomacy as distinct phases of action. But there are some wonderful counterpoints in US experience. So in my introduction, which I begin with Ben Franklin in uh, Paris during our revolution, there's a moment in 1777 where recall the United States has not been recognized by any foreign power. Um, uh, France were trying to court as a potential ally. And one of Franklin's colleagues says, look, we really have to lay down the law to the French here and say, you either support us or we're out of the struggle. And Franklin doesn't think that's a very good idea. He thinks he wants to wait until the military victory at Saratoga and use the victory. And then he actually lets the French know he's reaching out to the British in case the British want to consider some other arrangement. And then he strikes the alliance uh, with, with France in early 1778, which is how I start the book. And of course, in 1781, after Yorktown, Franklin uh, basically uh, o overrides the directions from Congress about not agreeing to something without France's approval and negotiates a very good deal with Britain, which allows us to have all the territory up, up to the Mississippi. I have a chapter on Thomas Jefferson and the Louisiana Purchase. And I try to look at how that came about. And one aspect was that Jefferson, uh, of course, eventually buys the territory, but he, he poses some threat to Napoleon by suggesting that we would have militia march all the way to New Orleans to kind of say, you, you either we take it or, or uh, you sell it to us. Um, Abraham Lincoln, where most all everyone will have read about the battles and generals and slavery and the social effects of the Civil War, but there's a critical foreign policy dimension. How do you stop British and French intervention? which would have totally changed history. And there's an incident late in 1861 where the US Navy takes two Confederate commissioners off a British ship that almost leads to war. And this is a case where uh, Lincoln decides one war at a time. So he kind of, he, he makes sure that his diplomacy uh, manages to uh, fit his, his means and ends. Around the turn of the century, there's an interesting period where the United States is starting to become a world power. But uh, we're not really willing to commit forces in a global sense. And so John Hay, who, and then later Teddy Roosevelt, basically create a mediation, or this is the open door doctrine in China, where they're trying to use a relatively weak hand because yes, is willing to do, have military power, but to play a role in reestablishing a balance of power. And I, I like the Hay chapter in part because uh, not long ago, I heard former Secretary of Defense Mattis say, you know, the United States may no longer have total domain dominance. And it made me think historically, we often didn't have total domain dominance. And so sometimes you have to play a weak hand as, as best you can. Um, I talked about the 1947-49 period, where it's sort of the building of the alliance system with, and then on the Marshall Plan. But here's another one that people might not have thought about. In the Korean War, after uh, MacArthur lands uh, the forces at Incheon and they start to move north, um, in a sense, he was so much on the trail of victory that perhaps Truman couldn't have stopped him. But you have to ask yourself diplomatically whether it would have been a wiser course if you're worried about Chinese intervention, which came at the end of 1951, if, if the US and UN forces would have stopped just a little bit short of the border of China, because there's a narrow piece in North uh, Korea which would have left it as an ineffective state, but would have avoided the potential of conflict with China. So it's a good example of 
even as wars are being conducted, one has to sort of think about what you really want to achieve there. In the case of Vietnam, coming back to your, your question, Mark, you know, one of the things that's interesting is you, you keep looking for Dean Russ, the Secretary of State. Where is he? You see McNamara, you see Bundy, but where's Dean Russ? And he's, he's sort of think, thinking, well, we have to have a military victory before we can conduct the diplomacy. And if you want to think about this today, you'll read in the papers a lot of debate about Taiwan and what will be the US commitment to Taiwan. Well, this is another issue where we have to decide as a country, you know, what is our objective? Is it to try to have an independent democratic Taiwan that's likely to lead to a conflict with China? Is it to preserve Taiwan's autonomy? So not as a free nation, but as a, de a democracy, but uh, in a somewhat unique position. Uh, and how would we be able to do that under various scenarios? Um, the Chinese military has expanded its capacity. Uh, will you be able to do this if you don't have support from Japan? So these questions that I've asked historically are quite relevant if you think about some of the challenges that you read about in the newspaper today. They are, and they're important uh, to our peace and security. So we, we encourage the students to think through those questions. We have a question from the audience saying, do you anticipate American foreign policy becoming more nativist or internationalist in the future? Well, um, this was certainly a phenomenon uh, during the Trump era. Although my own sense is that Trump was using foreign policy as a way of sort of communicating to his domestic audience about some of how he was gonna be different, he was gonna be transactional, um, some of the sense of resentments or, or frustrations with the past. So if you think about his anti-immigration policy or with the wall with Mexico, that was a continuation of his domestic politics, similarly some of his, his trade protectionism. But what's striking is if you look at surveys such as the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, which does an annual survey, the American public understands the connections with the world, whether it's trade or alliance issues, but it's a somewhat inchoate sense. It, it, you know, the, the, there's a need for the president and the Congress to be able to shape this. So I think that's one of the challenges uh, for the president and the political leaders of the country. Um, one of the other traditions that I mentioned that you, you, you mentioned in passing, Mark, was sort of America's purpose. And here, I, I don't use the term exceptionalism. Um, while I think US is, has been an exceptional country, that's a phrase that sometimes raises the hackles of others that also think they're exceptional. But there's no doubt that there is a notion in the United States from the founding that there's a larger purpose to be served. And my favorite anecdote for this is for those of you that still carry cash, someday take out a dollar bill and look on the back of the dollar bill. You'll see the great seal of the United States. And on the reverse of that, you probably never gave it much attention. You'll see this unfinished pyramid and notice it's unfinished with the eye of providence above it and the phrase below novus ordo seclorum. So that's new order of the ages. So from the very start, founders of the United States were trying to think about what was the larger purpose of this country, not only within its territory, but in the international system. And it's my belief that it evolves over time. So in the early uh, 19th century, it was simply to survive as a republic in a world of empires. Then it was preserving the union and dealing with the original sin of slavery. By the early 20th century, it's balance of power politics. For Woodrow Wilson, it's to make the world safe for democracies, not to make them democracies, but make the world safe for democracies. For Franklin Roosevelt, it's the four freedoms. Um, and during the Cold War, it's leader of the free world. For Bill Clinton, it's the indispensable power. So my belief is there's, there's always a combination here of the international context, um, your, uh, your resources and capabilities, uh, and the public's interest of what they'll do, but also some notion of a larger purpose to be served. And that's at the heart of what American politics is about. And we hope that it continues to be about that for many decades to come. A Colin says that he had an opportunity to hear from Sarah Sewell, who was Undersecretary of State in the Obama administration. And she wrote an article addressing the eroding 
technical advantage that the U.S. faces in diplomacy. What's your perspective on the bipartisan bill on competing with China that is moving through the Senate right now? It seems to increase investment in science technology. What is your outlook on, on how the U.S. has historically invested in hard military power and how the two might be changing right now? Technology, military power, rivalry with China, a lot of components of the question we have there. So this is a wonderful question. And because if, if you go and you check the title of the bill that I think you're talking about, it's called the Endless Frontier Bill. And it's, it's from Chuck Schumer, uh, a Democrat of New York, and Todd Young, Republican of Indiana. <coughs> and notice the title, the Endless Frontier Bill. It comes from Ben Eber Bush. And that was one of the ideas that uh, Senator Young had in putting it together was drawing on this exact experience that I talk about in this chapter. And so, of course, as Mark knows better than I do, there's always the devil in the details of legislation. But I think if, if the focus is to try to encourage conditions for science and technology research, particularly basic research, and include also sort of the education of university development, this can be a positive contribution. There's always a challenge um, when, when, when Congress gets involved with a popular cause that you'll start to find lots of other things funded in it as well. And then sometimes various groups decide, well, maybe we need some favorable funding for our industry or another industry. So in a way, if one goes back to the chapter I wrote with Van Eber Bush, Van Eber Bush was also a fiscal conservative and he didn't want money just being thrown at science and technology. He wanted some discipline in how it's done. So I think you'll see attention to this, but I also urge people to you know, put it through some rigorous uh, screen. So let me give you a particular example. There's a lot of attention now to uh, the government funding additional semiconductor plants because of the shortages of semiconductors. Well, first, you really do have to look at which types of semiconductors. There's lots of different qualities here. Frankly, a lot of the plants weren't built because a lot of the potential users, including auto companies, didn't expect the demand. So part of this is just going to be a supply and demand workout. And also, it turns out that the, the factors, the, the factories that actually produce semiconductors as opposed to design them are very capital intensive. And most businesses are quite careful about capital intensive environments. So one has to think about, yes, the United States needs cutting edge semiconductor capacity. We need access to it. Um, if you get it from South Korea as an ally or another plant in Arizona, you know, let's make sure we still have the market work. One of the interesting uh, dimensions of this, however, is a lot of production is in Taiwan, which goes right back to what we were talking about, about the importance of Taiwan to, to your security. So I think the general point is you're going to see a lot of focus on science and technology. You'll see this with a competition with China. Um, China is no doubt investing a lot. But it brings back to one of the ideas that I try to draw out a little bit in the chapter on Van Eber Bush, which is I think at the end of the day, science and technology will develop better in free societies. You wanna have people to have the freedom to experiment. You wanna have people uh, who are encouraged to kind of break out of sort of norms. You know, we'll see whether this turns out right, but I think one of the dangers we have in the anxiety about China is I think that we would make a mistake if we try to replicate some of the Chinese behavior. So frankly, some of this comes back to our openness as a society. Um, we talked about all the foreign students at St. John's University. I think America's strength is its openness to goods, ideas, capital, people. Um, so if we try to shut things down like China does, I don't think that serves our advantage. So I, I, I'm one of those people that would while recognizing dangers of some uh, foreign students from countries such as China, I think we're better off keeping our society open. I was just uh, spending time with uh, a number of other university presidents today talking about some of the most significant obstacles we face. And one of those is exactly what you just talked about. How do we continue to be open, but make sure that we preserve that competitive edge for America? And so I would, uh, you know, applaud Colin on this uh, this question because I would suggest that our our prosperity depends depends on us having that innovative edge. Our security 
depends on our forces having an innovative edge. And there's at least some concern as to whether uh, we're on a glide path to keep it. So uh, hopefully well, we talk. Talk. One other point, Mark, you know, um, you know, I, I have lots of, I advise various companies on the boards of some. And one of the things that's so striking in the innovative sector, you see it definitely in Silicon Valley, is the number of firms that are begun by immigrants. Um, people in Minnesota have certainly seen this in their experience as well. And so um, we, we, that to me is a sign that, you know, we wanna keep our society open. So this is a place where people wanna come and develop big dreams. We wanna be the place in the world where the people that are ambitious and smartest can be, wanna to come to make their mark in the world. We want that to be here in America, you're absolutely right. And I had two roommates from Hong Kong uh, during my time at St. John. So I, I, I very much value uh, having that openness in those international students. I have a, we have a question here. What advice do you have for students interested in, in international relations and diplomacy as a career? What advice would you have for them, Bob? So this has got to be a wonderful softball. My starting answer, of course, is to read a lot of history and start with my book. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I'm serious about the use of history um, because, um, Mark, when, when you and I were in college, there were sometimes area studies, which are in a sense multidisciplinary fields. And history is at heart a multidisciplinary field. Uh, my career, not people can have different paths, in a sense was a combination of law and history and public policy and economics and finance, international relations, governance management. I think it, it adds to your perspectives if you bring multiple uh, dimensions to problem solving. And that's what history does. And, and again, if you think about, take the different little, if you want case studies in my book, each of these are kind of, how do you deal with a problem bringing different issues to bear? Beyond that, um, this may sound a little odd to university students, but um, try to pick your boss. And this is gonna it may sound odd because of course you think your boss picks you and your boss of course does partly pick you. But what I mean by that is, in my experience, I, I learned a tremendous amount from the people who I was working with. And it didn't mean that I had to like everything about them or have every model myself after them in every different way, but I learned a heck of a lot. And, and then particularly on the public sector side, if you can find yourself in a position where you're working for someone, if you can think about how you can help that person do his or her job. So as opposed to thinking, gee, what do I think should be done? Try to understand what they need to get their job done. And that has an interesting effect, which is you're starting to think like the decision maker because you're helping the decision maker and it's a greater chance that you'll become the decision maker. So I suppose those would be my suggestions for advice. You know, I would advise uh, do a study abroad. There's nothing that really expands your minds more than having that opportunity uh, to be in a world where you're the odd person. You're the person that everybody's asking questions to that, uh, and, but, but having that, that cultural ex exchange will help to set you on that path. How, how important is it that they learn a foreign language as part of that, if they really wanna be in international relations or diplomacy, what role would you say that plays in, the, in that? Well, it certainly helps. Um, and it, frankly, this is always one of my weaknesses. Uh, it partly reflects my, my generation. I, I took German in high school. My family were German Americans. But I, I have to admit, um, <laughs> I, Germany, German to me was like math. And what I meant by that is I, I could do it, but I never quite understood how I was going to use it because I never imagined that I would be going to Germany. Well, in 1989, 90, I was the lead official on German unification. So some of my German became partially handy. But I, I think one of the benefits of the language goes to the point that you were making, Mark, is trying to understand a little bit about the culture and how other people think about things. So I, I had a variation of it, which is because I loved history, I had read a lot of history by the time I went to college. And so I actually, I took history of Africa and Latin America and British economic history, Russia and so, uh, Eastern Europe. And I, I kept trying to learn history uh, throughout my life. And it, one wonderful part of it is 
you know, many people abroad are surprised if Americans know anything about their country. It's a real plus if you know a little bit. And frankly, just know enough to ask questions. And uh, because Americans often don't have that familiarity, it certainly wins you a lot of, of friends along the way. You know, it is interesting. You, you said you didn't think you'd ever use German, and then you did. Uh, if you're thinking about a career in international relations, uh, spend time studying it. And I, too, would recommend, as I, as I did at the beginning of the hour, your book in Kissinger's to get yourself started. But while I was at grad school, I was taking a course in international finance. And uh, the professor, I kept thinking to myself, he's teaching this with such enthusiasm and interest, like he really thinks I'm going to use this someday. And it was, it was impossible for me to conceive of the fact that I would actually be using this someday. And then a couple of years later at Pillsbury, uh, we ended up uh, buying haagen and we had a lot of international uh, assets that we needed to hedge. So I did the second ever Euro Deutsche Mark bond offering by an American company. And I did a seven currency, multi-currency revolver so we could uh, finance haagen and, and Green Giant and Burger King around the world. And I found myself immersed in that. And so it, it is, you're gonna make opportunities for yourself if you learn a language, spend some time abroad, uh, study some of the international aspects of, of history, of, of finance, of, of whatever, uh, to create an opportunity uh, for yourself and, and the opportunities will hopefully come your way. Tell, talk, talk about the foreign service. Wait a minute, Mark, will you have to tell us, do you still get discounts on ice cream? <laughs> well, we, uh, we, uh, we always have, uh, we always have Haagen-Dazs, uh, haagen at the, at the Kennedy household. If I, if I can hold that up in the right direction so you can see it. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't look full. <laughs> yeah, well, come on over, we'll make sure it is full. But, uh, I want to just talk about foreign service because, um, you know, I, I've only been to 45 countries in the world. You've perhaps been more, but in many of those, I've, I've met with the embassies and had somebody from the Foreign Service uh, help me uh, around the, the country. That's as noble a service as the military, and it's a challenging service. It's a hard to get into, but what would your advice be to those that think that maybe I want to join the Foreign Service and, and be an officer uh, for the State Department? What, what would your advice to them be? Well, I'd even broaden it. You know, I, I mentioned that I was impressed that the number of uh, St. Benedict's and St. John's students went to uh, the Peace Corps. Uh, a lot of people that I met in the State Department often started out in the Peace Corps and, and they then later applied to take the Foreign Service exam. And so, um, and I would even expand it, you know, whether it's the office I used to head at U.S. Trade Representative, Department of Commerce, Treasury, uh, intelligence agencies, there's lots of different international affairs roles, uh, Defense Department on the civilian side. So I really, um, you know, I, I urge people to take a close look to see whether this might be part of their career path. You know, maybe it's something that one does at an early point and then one goes on to other types of career. Uh, I moved around, you moved around, Mark, at different points. But particularly for the State Department, the State Department has both a foreign service and a civil service. The foreign service, as you mentioned, takes that requires an examination. You could take a look and see what the exams are like. Um, foreign service careers, uh, of course, are challenging for people in terms of uh, you're expected to serve abroad as well as in Washington. So that sometimes puts challenges for uh, on, on family life. Um, and different people are drawn the different types of people are drawn to the Foreign Service. For some, it's the interest in cultures abroad, and they really want to spend most of their time abroad. For some, it's, uh, in a sense, the reporting and understanding function that we were talking about. And some, it's the policy making back in Washington. And you can, if, if, if you're particularly interested in this, the, the interesting thing to do is, as I mentioned a little bit with bosses, is to follow career paths. And you can see how different people follow different career paths. So, um, and often what will happen to foreign service officers who are on the rise is they'll work as uh, assistants, either as executive assistants, staff assistants, uh, 
to the political appointees. So I was a presidential appointee starting in 1989 with Bush 41 um, and working for James Baker. And a number of the people who actually worked for me as an assistant, one of them is Nick Burns, who's likely to become our ambassador to China. Um, another was Bill Burns, who's just become the CIA director. And so that's a path that people want to try to develop contacts. And what's important to recognize is that it, it's not, it doesn't make them political. They're working for political appointees, but frankly, these people will work across uh, different administrations. So as in anything, uh, it depends upon your interests. Uh, but I think um, some of the initial paths that, that we've discussed, whether it's studying abroad, education abroad, uh, working abroad, Peace Corps, is a good way to get an initial feel whether this might be attractive to you. It's a good, good advice. Now, what are your thoughts about the rise of cryptocurrency? Will there be any impacts on traditional nation state trade and the international economy? What's, what's your thoughts on that new development? So when I think about cryptocurrencies, I, I, I think you have to divide it into different pieces. Uh, so one is um, the, the notion of the kind of the, the coins themselves. And uh, in my view, a lot of them are rather speculative asset investments. They're like uh, cyber gold uh, that, that sometimes people try to use to sort of hedge inflation and other issues. Then many of them rely on blockchain technology. I think separate from uh, from from Bitcoin or some other devices, the blockchain technology is going to be increasingly significant and important. It has very high energy usage, and that's going to be something that uh, people are going to have to work with. But it's a way of, in a sense, validating the transaction without the formal intermediary system, because the, the blockchain really sense checks it through a whole network. That will be quite important for example, for some developing countries um, where the confidence in sort of the reliability of some of the partners isn't quite there. There's a third aspect that's related to Bitcoin and some of the other currencies, uh, which is the transactional nature. So whether you can move things more quickly, the, the costs, uh, uh, and that there's a whole obviously field related to FinTech. Then there's the broader issue of digital currencies. And so digital currencies don't, can also be run by the government. And you'll see China is developing a digital RMB here. And this goes, I think, to the heart of some of the question. Um, this is in part a response, uh, China, to trying to work around the US dollar and the sanctions and controls that we have. Um, and I think it will proceed. It's, it's a little different than saying the same as China becoming a reserve currency. There can be a reserve currency. Investors need to have confidence in the legality of your markets and non-interference and have a certain liquidity and depth and China's well away from that. But as for the, and, and you'll see that, there, that a digital currency from a government also will raise complicated issues for monetary policy. So for example, if the government in a sense, controls the currency through a digital account, then what's the role of banks as uh, creators of credit? Do, do, they, do they get disintermediated by the digital currency system? And does that mean that the government then, in a sense, takes the credit risk or does it work through the bank intermediary systems? There's also a privacy system. So one of the appeals of some Bitcoins and other cyber currencies is sort of to move out of the established system, depending on the encryption, that raises questions of terrorist finance and, and organized crime. But a digital currency, say from China, would also mean that the government knows and controls all your money and finances, and that has sort of political effects. So what I've tried to do here, and it's, it's almost a, a good example, Mark, of what I've talked about, practical or pragmatic problem solving. I'm trying to take a topic and disaggregate the pieces and give you a sense that some of them will have different dimensions and then you have to see how they fit back together. But as a general matter, you know, um, you are certainly gonna move to a greater FinTech environment and that will include uh, digital currencies over time. The world's only gonna get more complicated, not less as we move forward. 
Um, there seems to be some debate, we have a questioner asking, whether China is leaning towards nationalist values as opposed to communist values. Uh, how does this distinct, how does a distinction like this impact how America deals with China? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think China involves both a nationalistic pride, uh, but also there's no doubt that particularly under Xi Jinping, he strengthened um, the role of the Communist Party. Um, I don't necessarily feel that this is the same, that he has the same uh, sort of aims for communism as you might have had in the early Soviet Union where there was a revolutionary communist. And this, in a sense, comes back to the nationalism point. In fact, I think there's almost a belief in the exceptionalism of the Han people. And so the Chinese communist system focuses on, in a sense, uh, the, the Han people, as opposed to thinking that they're going to try to expand revolutionary communism around the world. You can see the tensions with the Communist Party, for example, um, in Vietnam. But there's no doubt that this authoritarian thinking affects Xi Jinping. And to share with you one anecdote, um, I had gotten to know Xi Jinping when he was party secretary in Xinjiang province. He visited me at the State Department. And when I left government, I visited him in his capital in Hangzhou. I saw him when he was vice president. I'd done a lot of work at the World Bank on economic development in China. So when he became president, I was with him in a small meeting and I didn't have a chance to ask too many questions, but I, one, I tried to get a sense of what his priorities were in, in development. And he said, the 86.68 million members of the Communist Party. So today, I think it's about 90 million. Now, that was certainly sending a message because I'd spoken to a lot of presidents and prime ministers over the years. And if I'd asked them about their economic plans, I don't think any of them would have mentioned their party membership. <laughs> but what it showed was that he was quite concerned about what he felt was the corruption and the undermining and confidence in the Communist Party. And he certainly moved the system in another direction. I think what it, whether nationalism or communism, the bigger question for the United States is, can you work with China? Can you find areas where there are gonna be common interests while also deterring and defending against things that, that you don't like? And um, I, I frankly think that in the later Trump period, there was basically a condemnation of China, a confrontation with China, but not a clear sense of, well, what do you really want to accomplish? That's not the same as competition. It's hard to see how you're going to deal with issues like um, climate change or biological security or the international economy unless you figure out some way to work with China. Um, contrary to some of the rhetoric today, there's actually been a lot accomplished working with China on the international economy, even on security matters. When I was dealing with genocide in Darfur, I got the Chinese to help me with some of those issues as well. But there are no doubt that there are going to be differences. And this is where I think the administration is properly trying to work with partners and allies in the region and in Europe to try to make sure that we can deter Chinese action that we feel could be aggressive or threatening, whether in the East China Sea, South China Sea, Taiwan. Um, and then it also will become a contest of as we've talked about, set of values and system. And here, again, I think the danger is sometimes if the United States gets too fearful of China, we start to imitate China. We start to feel we have to close things down. And I don't think that will serve our long-term strength or our appeal. And just to give you one, again, practical example, China has clearly uh, clamped down on Hong Kong and ended the two, uh, one country, two systems approach. You can take sanctions on Hong Kong officials, but I'm not sure you will accomplish as much. And maybe we should look at something like the British have done, which is to say, maybe we should open the possibility for people from Hong Kong to come to the United States. What better way to show the difference between the two societies than to allow people from Hong Kong to come? And by the way, I think they probably enrich our society. So this is gonna be a long-term competition. The United States will be most effective if we do so with allies and partners. Those allies and partners will not want to decouple from China, but they'll also be sensitive to trying to push China to play by in a more agreed set of rules. Uh, a big issue, no doubt. And I have two more questions. The first is, 
wanting you to elaborate on the politics and the significant policy impact of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Aid Plan for AIDS Relief. And our students today are too young to remember the, the AIDS epidemic, how it was devastating Africa. I know this is something that I consistently voted for during my time in Congress. And we both know Mark Green, uh, who recently served as the head of USAID. This is one of the things he was most proud of to help them understand what that what that plan was and how big of an impact it had and how hard it was to get going. So to just help people recall, uh, this was absolutely ravaging uh, sub-Saharan African publics. And um, through some of the same research, for example, that Tony Fauci who has been involved with COVID uh, was one of the leaders in being able to develop treatments for HIV AIDS so is to both uh, have efforts to prevent its transmission, but also to deal with it in an effective way. What President Bush organized was not only sort of the delivery of the appropriate drugs, but importantly, he worked with the African countries and some other international bodies on the delivery system. So, and this is one of the issues I encountered at the World Bank is that the, the healthcare systems as we know are difficult you know, within developed countries such as the United States or Canada. It certainly was much, much harder in Sub-Saharan Africa and many developing countries. So it was a real focus on the issue of trying to target resources for development to make sure you had effectiveness in outcomes. So not just focus on the inputs or the money that you spend, but on trying to assess and learn how to make sure you could improve the overall uh, results. And uh, in terms of its effect on the US-African relations, you know, I discovered and I, I probably visited 30 or 40 sub-Saharan African countries in my time at the World Bank. It was probably the most important symbol of US commitment to sub-Saharan Africa of anything in our history. I think you're right. And, and Ambassador Green would say the same. Our final question here uh, from Colin again, what advice would you give to someone looking to approach foreign policy from a political role, particularly in this political climate, whether in Congress or executive branch? We've, we've talked about careers, but not so much uh, trying to go at it from a political perspective. Well, this may be a better question for you, Mark, uh, because we, we should hear from what you have to say. You are an elected official. Um, I, look, I think a couple of thoughts. One, um, it's always helpful to know what you want to talk about. So you still want to learn the fundamentals, whether it's uh, the security issues, the economic issues, some of the aspects of diplomacy, see how it's done before. Um, and then again, um, when it comes time to uh, sort of working on these topics, one route is through the Congress with members of Congress that are interested in foreign affairs, whether they become one of their legislative assistants. It's a little harder, but it's also possible to work on some of the, with the committee staffs that, uh, whether it's the Foreign Relations or House International Relations Committee, or by the way, the Armed Services or the Finance or Ways and Means Committee on some of the trade and economic issues. Um, and if you wanna run for office with international issues, um, I'll defer to you, Mark. Um, I suspect you have to be able to speak to people at home uh, in ways that they will understand uh, and also build constituent support. If I take Minnesota as an example, um, you know, you've probably got communities that, uh, whether from immigrant communities or from humanitarian causes or church causes, different aspects. And so uh, my sense as a non-elected official was that good politics was trying to expand your base and coalition of support. So I'd be looking to each of those to see their international interests. but. You, you should close. This is something you did. I will just say that uh, I have an example of when I first got into Congress, I had a, uh, a staffer that was, uh, he's from Maryland, but he went to the University of Minnesota. And he really desperately wanted a job, he used to work for Senator Graham's, came to me. So we put him at the front desk, which is the lowest, uh, uh, that's the bottom of the totem pole in a congressional office. You said, well, if anybody asks you from Minnesota, just say you went to the University of Minnesota. He was absolutely lousy in that job. We had to move him to the back uh, room to work, you know, writing letters to constituents. He worked his way up, 
Uh, he was more recently in the National Security Office, uh, National Security uh, in the White House. Uh, and uh, some of my friends have said he's going to be Secretary of Defense someday. So you uh, can make it. I, I would encourage everything we talked about, study abroad, read your book, all those other things are going to help you there. But particularly if you're going to go to the political side, don't be afraid to start at the bottom. Uh, it works. Uh, work hard, show your worth, uh, prepare yourself. And it's, it's some, a, a service that I would recommend. Uh, we need people that understand on the front side of that dollar you were talking about, when it shows the national seal, the only thing in that national seal is e pluribus unum, out of many one. We need people in politics today that are, are not so much in the corners of the parties, but understand particularly in foreign policy, uh, our differences used to end at the border. And uh, more and more, if we can have that, it would be great. So this has been a fabulous, you had a last hey, comment? Mark, can, I, can I just add one thought? One other point you didn't mention, but it really goes to the heart of your career as well, which is that, remember, you know, one of the things we, we talked about, we, didn't, uh, we mentioned the five traditions in the book. One we didn't focus on was public support in Congress. And uh, at, at heart, you cannot have a successful foreign policy unless you've got the support of Congress and the American people. So when you think about this as somebody from the political side, even the, your example of somebody working at the front desk is important because unless they can figure out how to, how to, how to speak to people who are gonna be voting for members or voting for you at some day, um, it's hard to be successful. You have to learn what they're thinking and their concerns and, and be able to communicate more widely. So this has been a fabulous uh, conversation. I very much appreciate you taking time, time with us. Hopefully someday we can have you walk through the most beautiful campus in the planet. Uh, that's at St. John's University, of course. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for our, all our participants. I'll turn it back over to Matt. Well, thank you very much, Mark and Bob. This was a fantastic evening, great conversation. You really hit the three E's, enjoyable, educational, and engaging, and, and really uh, just a fabulous, in-depth, uh, pragmatic, and uh, an enriching conversation. So thank you all for joining us, and have a great evening. Good to be with you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.